and welcome to another crossover event of Lizzie Watches Yowie and myself and Gaia's horror podcast Beneath Your Skin, where we look at films depicting demonic possession and exorcism, which of course ties in beautifully to a Sean and I anime series about two hot priests that solve mysteries that involve things such as exorcism and demonic possession, but with lots of overly familiar touching and beautiful boys everywhere. I love anime. Yeah, and I now understand why. I mean, come on, what is not to love in such a beautiful anime? <laughs> That's really good. And this is episode four, and the episode is called Even So, I Shall Believe in the Lord God. And I think that kind of like sums up how the end of the episode goes and the fact that with all this testing and of everything that's going on, they still have faith, even though the roots of evil got all the way back to the Vatican with all the corruption and the money laundering and the fronts. But it's like, yes, you can see all that corruption at tests you, but you still have faith. Which I think is, you know, a nice little message. But the episode basically starts off directly where the last one ended. And thankfully, it turns out that horrible cliffhanger where we thought Roberto had been stabbed. He had not been stabbed. At the last minute, mysterious figure from the bushes shoots our mysterious figure with a knife and kills him. And it's actually a mysterious figure that is being shot. And they're like, oh my goodness, it is James Chester. And it's like, wait a minute, the... The security guard that's been wandering around screaming about devil worship children is also now trying to murder them. Like, how is he involved in any of this? So I'm like, we get a woohoo reveal. And also, uh, OK, that just adds more questions, because now we need to work out why is James involved trying to stab the Vatican examiners? Or who is the guy in the bushes that's shooting James? So our Vatican miracle examiners, they're a bit flubbergasted by all of this, but there's no time to wait. They got to chase these students that have like run away after playing Ouija board and they catch up to one of them and lo and behold, it's Sebastian. You're like, well, we knew you were going to be one of the weird devil summoning children. And it's like, what are you doing like out here? And Joseph is like, you know, what? it's late. There's a guy with a gun on the loose now. Please go back to your dorm. Until Roberto goes, wait a minute, I have one question. And like, ooh, do get our beautiful credits, beautiful men who love each other and need to touch each other and glowing lights and Vaticans and exorcisms and all that beautiful anime gorgeousness. And we find out after the credits that what Roberto wanted was the Ouija board because obviously it was written in runes. And by getting it, he knows that actually it works as a cipher so he can decode all the runes that are written in this demonic book and also written on the walls. And we're like, oh, Roberto, you're so clever. You're clever man. Yeah. It came out. The diary belongs to the former leader of the Gestapo. Who wasn't a good man? No. It's just like, oh, I mean, I thought it was just going to be some evil Nazis that had escaped and were still dealing in black magic and human experimentation and were using this as a hidey hole and a front and stuff. I wasn't expecting it to kind of basically be the reincarnation of the actual entire Nazi movement. I was like, oh, oh, okay. So this is like, yeah, it's getting a bit more serious. So they mentioned some words that I couldn't even pronounce. They were like, it's the um, Ullenbach. And I was like, what is the Ullenbach? But I don't know. It's the Ullenbach and it's basically a famous line from Mein Kampf. And the minute they say it's a famous line from Mein Kampf, I'm like, oh my God, you are reading a diary either written by Hitler or written by someone who really loves Hitler or is really close to Hitler. And lo and behold, it's Heinrich, and we know from the, the ledger, the tally, and it's one Heinrich Müller, as you say. Very big member of the Nazi party, quite a famous, you know, leader of Gestapo's and like, you know, yeah, very bad man that was very well known for the experimentation of humans and downright disregard for anyone's life. And essentially you find out the story of a Nazi pilgrimage, a Nazi crusade in which they wanted to put some of their best scientists and their purists on their version of the Ark, which is obviously the Rosenberg like blimp, fly them to the promised land, build up a new land by making money from drugs. And it's just like, oh, oh, there's, there's a whole lot of crazy going on here. And they also wanted to, you know, reincarnate Hitler. Because why not? Why not? I mean, Hitler was the one who made sure 
all of them had um, faults and foraged uh, papers to leave German and uh, to leave Germany and uh, to go to the these to this new land in which they were supposed to keep uh, going on with the Third Reich, the real beginning of the true Third Reich, and we find out that Mr. Mueller had his name changed, of course, in one of these forged passport, and is Michael Brown, okay. of course. And I have to point out there is only one little um, mistake in this episode. Uh, I don't know if it's just the translation from uh, Japanese to English or if it's in the Japanese version also, but um, they say the new passport Michael Brown had was an Italian passport, yeah. but we see clearly the double keys crossed, uh, and that's the, uh, the symbol of the Vatican City. So basically, he was traveling with the uh, city of the Vatican passport, and that's one of the most powerful passports in the world, because basically it means that you are traveling as a Vatican uh, person. So you have all the immunity that that status can give you. Right. Uh, so it's, it's probably something that like translation wise, they just went, it's an Italian passport rather than kind of go, it's a Vatican passport, because a lot of people wouldn't know the difference, wouldn't like not everyone knows that the Vatican City is actually its own country with its own. It just happens to reside in Italy. So I think that would have been like whoever was doing the subtitles just kind of gave it a simpler translation because, yeah. Not many people know that thing, but you know it's it's, it's a, quite a small mistake in what's been a really well researched thing, and it could be a mistake that was actually not really the original creators because they obviously intended for him to be related to the Vatican to get all that freedom, so he could also you know get a church and everything. So I think it was a translation. I'm going to go with a translation fault, but yeah. It, and it's, Oh, sorry. I just I just wanted to point out that, that was a very heartful uh, and painful uh, page of uh, he, uh, world history, Italian history, and Vatican history. Uh, the relationship, the the the, the bond between uh, the Nazi German and the Vatican were proved. Even if the Pope himself at the end of the war was trying to save as many Jewish people as possible and he went uh, uh, face to face against uh, the uh, Nazi ambassador in Rome and he denied uh, Hitler's powers and he went against uh, Hitler and Mussolini in many of his speeches, uh, there were still people inside the Vatican that helped many Nazi hierarchs to, to leave uh, Europe for South America. That's, uh, that, that's sadly something that really happened. Ah, see, I didn't know that. It was like, because as this episode goes on, it starts, I start having a little bit of leaps of faith because I don't know the history. But to actually know, up until kind of like the revelation at the end, it's actually all true it's actually historically accurate they you know the vatican helped nazis escape to south america and it's like whoo oh no wonder like you know they want to keep that quite quiet but no this anime is like yeah no it presented it and i was just like oh this has got to just be some crazy storytelling no it's not crazy storytelling this stuff was really going on yeah there was a city in italy from which many ships departed from South America. And we now know uh, on some of those ships, uh, there were Nazi hierarchs escaping Europe and escaping the Nuremberg trial and escaping the Allies trials and trying to escape the um, Israel justice. Because uh, there is something I want to, to say, to tell you, but we can wait until the end of the of the episode because it's where I can connect to what I have to say. But yes, the, the city in Italy was Genova. Okay, so yeah. 
Well, the Maritimes, so, yeah. That's, that's... Maritimes, okay. Yeah. The Maritimes, one of the four Maritimes republics in Italy. So Genova was the place from where many escaped. Yeah. Oh. I love it when there's actual historical accuracy within a show that originally I watched because of pretty boys loving each other and then because I'm really like demonic possession and exorcism movies. It was very interesting. Well, if we thought it wasn't crazy enough, it gets another layer of crazy in which we find out about how these immaculate conceptions are coming to be. Because it turns out that Brown, who used to be Heinrich Müller, obviously they were doing a lot of experimentation at the time and a bit of human experimentation. And one of the things that they decided to do was to try and revive Hitler by injecting his frozen, cryogenically frozen sperm into the body of his daughter. And you're like, oh, so no wonder Mary Brown is a little bit unhinged. Not only did she give birth to a hideously two-headed deformed baby, it was also the father of this hideously deformed baby was Hitler. And I think no wonder she her mind snapped and she went a bit ugh, schizophrenic. So we find out that not only this is going on, but the other ploy is that the students of the school are actually all being brainwashed by these Nazis because they are having this special class which they are learning and really the special class and its weird headsets is just basically brainwashing them with this frequency and teaching this whole new wave of children on how to revive the Third Reich and to be the new Hitler youth and it's like oh oh goodness not only are some of these kids being like abused, some of them are like trying to summon demons, you know, people are being murdered. You're also trying to turn them into the new Hitler youth by brainwashing them. And you're using their school as a front for drug running. I'm like, it just keeps getting worse. Like, you don't even need a supernatural element to this for it to be like one of the worst things ever. Like, poor, poor children. And they're basically, our, our main characters are like, more they read this journal, are just like... You are, really? Really? Just the look on their faces of like, oh my God, wait a minute. And they're like, yep, so everything's going down. They were trying to bring forth the new Messiah. And they thought they would impregnate poor Mary and give her the new Messiah. Unfortunately, or fortunately, because I don't know how good a life or how healthy this two-headed baby would have been. And she's trying to give, well, they're trying to get her to give birth to Hitler. And they want him to be the new Messiah and also their Lord Janus. But first baby dies, but the second child survives. And we discover that the second child is this Thomas Simon, which obviously is interesting because he's named after the two like doubting like figures from the Bible and the two that were not quite as on board with Jesus being the Messiah. So it makes sense that he is the son of Hitler and the, you know, the vessel for Lord Janus and the new Messiah of demon black arts hitler reincarnation cult that's essentially going on it's a lot going on i was like whoo our priests have got to go and to investigate they have got some proper investigating to do they've got to try and find out what's going on they've noticed that all the priests seem to have disappeared from everywhere and all the nuns are fast asleep and it turns out their water has been spiked so they won't wake up and they're like thank goodness we have antidotes for that so that we didn't get spiked to sleep through this whole mess like there is like another murder being committed and another uh, leon has been hung drawn and quartered like the martyr charlotte i don't know anything about her uh no a uh, saint catherine i was in catherine i'm there saint catherine the martyr was uh... A little bit of a controversial figure in the Catholic Church because for the Church of Old Ages, she is one of the major uh, martyrs. But uh, nowadays, uh, many scholars are um, wondering if she was really uh, a real person or if uh, her story was. Uh, a desperate attempt to change uh, uh, the point of view and shift blame about the, um, the scholar figure of Hypatia. Both women were born in Alexandria, but we know Hypatia was a scholar and she was uh, um, challenging 
the newborn church because she was a woman who dared to teach to men and who dared to adopt the, the fundamental of Christianity. So the Bishop of Alexandria, uh, Saint Cyrillus, who is one of the biggest name in the Orthodox Church, uh, he called the believers against her. So she was basically killed in the streets by a ferocious mob of people who killed her, uh, cutting her body with uh, broken shells. So you can imagine how much she suffered. She actually suffered before she died. So to try to shift blame, many are now claiming that St. Uh, Catherine of Alexandria was created to, to make the Christian the good people and the pagans the bad ones. Uh, her story is uh, honestly is a little bit too much in my humble opinion because basically she was supposed she supposedly she was uh, a princess in Alexandria. She was born from the governor of Alexandria. And uh, when she was 14, she had a dream of uh, the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. And after that dream, she converted to Christianity. She was already a scholar, a very well-known scholar. We have to remember at the time, we are talking about the fourth century. Lifespan was shorter, so it can be believed that at 14, she was already a scholar. So uh, one day she spoke against the cruelty of Emperor um, Masentium. And uh, Masentia decided to put her against 50 uh, pagan philosophers who should have been able to destroy the fundamental of her thinking and of her teaching. But she uh, defeated them all and many of them converted because they were touched by the, her brilliant mind and by the truth of her words. The emperor didn't take it well. So he had her scourged so badly that the whole of her body was covered in uh, woods. And then he threw her in a prison uh, without food so that she could starve to death. But it said that the angels themselves tended at her woods and fed her. So when after, uh, during her, um, her stay in the prison, many people went visiting her, even uh, Masensium's wife, and they all converted to Christianity after just a few moments with her. So after 12 days, the doors of the prison were open and she came out of, uh, of her prison even more beautiful than, uh, than before. The emperor was so enraged that uh, he decided to to marry her by force, but she denied him because she promised herself to Jesus. So he was so furious that condemned her to the, to the torture of the will. But as soon as the will touched her body, he said it shattered. And when finally the emperor decided she had to be beheaded, not blood, but a milk-like substance came from her neck. And as you can, as you can see, it's a little bit too much. So yeah. it's really possible that she was created uh, out of the figure of Ipatia to shift blame and to make the Christian people appear as the good guys and not the bad guys. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's so interesting, and it's it's still interesting seeing how all these figures are like being used and represented in this and actually like knowing who these figures are to represent like these murders so a wonderful priest joseph and roberto go to investigate one of the final places and they're looking at this altar where the lance of longinus is and they notice that there's 
a slight difference between the casing on this one and the casing on the one in Brown's office. So Roberto pushes it and dun dun dun, dun secret passageway. <laughs> and it's like, oh yes, there is an entire industrial complex hiding underneath this church. There is all the Nazi science equipment. It's all the technology. They're making drugs. It's underneath the aqueduct and they're using, because it's a covered aqueduct once it goes out in the world, and they're using that to transport the drugs out into the city. We're using the money of the drugs to like fund the Heinrich Corporation, laundering it through the Vatican. And yeah, they've pretty much found this base of operations. But while they're finding all this out, they hear some chanting. And they go to, inv to investigate the chanting. And then we get a whole nother level of madness. For one thing, that all the priests are praying to their new Messiah, one Thomas Simon, who is shouting back, and who am I? I am the Messiah. And they're like, you are the Messiah. I am your Lord. You are our Lord. And it's all like, well, he's gone a little bit nutso. He's looking a little bit like cray cray. And we also find out that he used to be much loved by the students and he used to be a really kind figure. It was said that, like, you know, he had a bit too much of his mother in him and too kind. So they thought that their dear Hitler did not reincarnate properly inside him. So they tried to repeat the process and that's how they artificially inseminated Dolores. And they're like, but awakening Hitler's spirit awakened inside Thomas and he is now fully ready to accept his position as their lord and savior and lord Janus Hitler and, and just demon worshiping and yeah generally going a little bit crazy with power and they're all they're all down with it because yeah it's 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 not a pretty thing and they Roberto says that he's got a split personality, like his other personality has come through and taken over and the person he used to be is gone. And it's seen in the fact that Thomas kills Johannes because he's like, you doubted me, stab, you're dead. And he's like, oh, we just murdered them. And he goes, we will now have a sacrifice. We're going to sacrifice the Vatican examiners that are hiding in the shadows over there. And you're like, oh, shit, it's time for our beautiful boys to escape this den of insanity in which you see Thomas flip a switch. This weird sound comes out. And as our priests escape, all the students are there, like, just ready to murder them. And it turns out they've obviously been hypnotized and brainwashed. And it doesn't look like there's going to be much escape for our lovely guys. And Thomas is just like, ha ha, I'm going to murder you with this knife. And by this point, he has just gone full crazy and full, I'm going to murder you. And Joseph is like, no, you are the most kind of evil. Like, you are the devil and I'm going to exorcise you. And he starts performing an exorcism. He starts shouting like, like. The, the, the scripture and the words of exorcism start splashing him with holy water and the holy water starts burning his flesh and Roberto is like, oh my God, he's a real demon. And Thomas is like, how? How is this holy water burning me? No, I'm the new Lord. No. Um, he obviously goes to stab Joseph and luckily Roberto pulls him out of the way just at the very last second, but not before the bottle is like cracked open and, and all the holy water drenches him and he catches on fire. And then just more craziness is happening because like... There's also turns out that these evil Nazis have smuggled the body of Hitler himself from Germany on this ancient pilgrimage. And his body is in the altar downstairs because why not keep the body of Hitler around when you've gone this full crazy and evil? So we have the body of Hitler. We've got a man possessed by Janus, Hitler, everything going on. And then we start seeing explosions and someone has planted bombs everywhere and bombs on the blimp and, and explosions are going on. And you're just like, whoa, everything's kicking off. And now I'm not entirely sure what's going on. But luckily through all this crazy, the hypnotism on the students is broken. We find out that Tomas was trying to use... Um, Mario as a bit of a scapegoat and thought like oh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna try and strangle him to keep the others like distracted it's like oh poor Mario he was literally totally innocent in all of this and he was just being used as a scapegoat for going kind of look over here at this look this beautiful boy's being like stigmatized it's like no this beautiful boy is being tortured continuously just as a front for your crazy and it's like oh dear um but the students get out 
everything's burning. I've, I've even written in my notes. It's like, Thomas burns, building burns, everything explodes, fire everywhere. But they get out and Hiragi and Roberto are kind of in each other's arms still kind of going, oh my God, that was a lot of crazy. Like, what is going on? But Tomas is not dead. He is just still on fire, burning away. Just all you can see is some mad eyes and some gnarly manky teeth. And he's like, I'm going to murder you. And they're like, oh, what, what, okay. and then the mysterious shooter shoots him, shoots him a lot. He gets a fair few holes. And we find out that the mysterious shooter is Father McGee. And we're like, I've kind of forgotten about you for a bit because you hadn't been it in a while. But I honestly thought you were the guy that kidnapped Dolores. But no, you're the shooter. Turns out he did not kidnap Dolores. He saved her. In fact, he was never a bad guy at all. He was part of a secret society called Zion's Law, who have been charged since the Second World War, passed down by generations, to hunt the last remaining Nazis and destroy them. And it's him that set all the bombs and made everything explode. And he has been the one that was like trying to like get rid of this conspiracy and basically our poor vatican examiners just got caught in the middle of a lot of insanity and they was they say that well no wonder this church did not want us investigating immaculate conception because it was actually like insemination and with you know hitler babies but it turns out this place is also being investigated by the zion's law also it turns out that it was not holy water being used in that ritual like Hiragi had been throwing sulfuric acid on Joseph and he's like I didn't really want to, on Thomas I didn't really want to do it but I kind of had to and I'm like you know what when a knife wielding crazy Nazi is brainwashing children and trying to murder you I think sulfuric acid is an okay option it is it totally is I just wanted to point out that uh, the Zion law is based on something real um, after the war Many of the survivors of the camps who weren't believed at the beginning of the many trials that um, followed the end of the war decided to um, take things in their own hands. So after they were healed, because we have to remember people spending even a few months in a camp really came out just like skeletons, walking skeletons, uh, were nothing uh, compared to people who spent one or two years or even more in those camps. So mm, one of them, the most famous Nazi enter, was uh, Simon Wiesenthal. Simon Wiesenthal had lost his whole family in Auschwitz. Everyone died but his wife. And there is a, a funny story about the way he found her back. Because after he left the Allies Hospital, in which he spent months trying to regain some of his weight and humanity, uh, he um, heard rumors of his wife being alive and looking for him. But he knew sadly that many families were even more broken after false hope was given to them about the survival of some members of said families so he didn't want to risk it and he sent uh, he found uh, a note on a billboard in, on which many jewish people left their actual addresses and names to try to find back their beloved and he found his wife's name. So he was he answered her, but when they decided to meet, he sent a friend and didn't go himself. When Mrs. Wiesenthal saw that the person talking to her wasn't her husband, she slapped him <laughs> twice and then ordered him to be taken to her husband. So that's how they 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 find each other again. Uh, what he did was uh, um, he began to keep trace of uh, the many Nazi uh, people involved with the Auschwitz camps who escaped. He was sure many of them weren't as dead as they wanted to for other people to believe. So 
he followed every single um, trace or clue he could find. And finally, he found the director of Auschwitz. He found out he wasn't that, like many were telling him, he was in Argentina. So what he did, Argentina denied uh, the extradition. So he decided to do something very crazy, totally illegal. He traveled to Argentina on a private plane with some of his uh, men, friends, who then became agent for the Simon Wiesenthal Association. And uh, they found him, dragged him, took him on the plane, even if the police was chasing them because they were alerted that someone had kidnapped what looked like an innocent import-export businessman, they were able to put him on the plane and the plane had uh, the Israel flag on it. So basically, when they were inside the plane, they were on Israel land. So the Argentinian police couldn't take back the one they just kidnapped and they were able to bring him to Israel where he was trialed and found guilty of crimes against humanity. Wow. He's and, brave people. Yeah, yes, they wanted justice because uh, we have to remember six million yeah. were killed for no reason at all, if not just because they were Jewish. Yeah. And... Uh, the survivors wanted, they wanted, ju wanted justice, even because at the beginning, as I said, they weren't even believed. There are so many of those survivors who died keeping the horror they survived inside because they, they were worried, they were afraid that other people wouldn't believe them. And we can't forget that one of the most disgusting things the, some of the Nazi soldiers who guarded the camps did was to put the numbers, the tattoo numbers on their own arms when it was clear the, the war was lost to pass for victims and to escape trials and justice. So, yeah, no, justice yeah. needed to be. And I'm actually like, the fact that they went and they got him and got him tried and got justice rather than just went off and killed him was like, I mean, that takes immense like strength of will and character to, because vengeance is one thing, but they went out and they got justice and it was well deserved. They, they wanted for these people to be trialed because uh, if we uh, analyze the Norimberga trial, the most famous trial at the end of the war, Mm, we can see that, yes, those hierarchs were found guilty. Many of them didn't even wait for the end of the trial. They killed themselves with the cyanide teeth okay. they all had. <clears throat> so uh, the Nuremberg trial didn't really bring justice to the Jewish people. Even because the most important one, they had Goebbels, he killed himself. He didn't even wait. Even because he knew that at the end of the trial, they were going to be uh, hanged for their crimes. But yeah. he didn't want to give the people the satisfaction to see him pay for what he did. So it was an important trial, but it didn't really bring... Um, justice to yeah. the Jewish people. It only brought something very important. Since that trial, the excuse, I was just following order, doesn't excuse soldiers anymore. Yeah. Because after that trial, during that trial, the judge told the soldiers who were using those words to justify themselves, he reminded them that they were still humans. They still had free will. And they had had to know that what was happening was wrong. Most definitely. So this is what inspired this Zion's Law, the secret society that Father McGee works for. 
and he is a spy that's going out and finding the last remaining like members and it also turns out that father mcgee wasn't alone and it now explains why Francesco and Dorothea were murdered because they weren't, in fact, priest and a nun. They were also spies. They may have been having a sexual relationship, but it didn't matter because they're not like religious figures. Then they were they were just two spies trying to try. And so they were murdered because their presence was found out. And by murdering them, it signs. And you also start thinking about like the other people that got murdered are all ones that had information that threatened to reveal what was really going on. So they weren't sinners that were being murdered, as you're led to believe. Like, they were all ones that were behaving in a way that could get the real, like, truth out. So it was like, oh, goodness, well, that explains it. So it was James who was obviously being brainwashed and taken in by this, like, these Nazi priests was out doing their bidding by murdering people for them. And it's like, oh, goodness. But alas, they're all dead now. These evil people, the students are safe. They, they've got time to, like, you know, heal and move on. The entire conspiracy has been, like, revealed. And then the line that I like is the fact they're like, oh, but what about, like, Dolores? She still has Hitler's baby. And McGee turns around going, just because the child she carries has the DNA of Hitler does not mean that he's going to grow up and be that man and I love the fact that it's about nature and nurture and the fact that it's like your DNA doesn't single out what you're going to go up in life and you know it's just it's there's a chance that she's just going to give birth to a beautiful baby that will grow up and be happy and lovely and I'm like I like that I like the fact that DNA does not say whether or not you're going to turn into a murderer even because Thomas uh wasn't made crazy and murderous by his DNA, but by the way he was raised since the day he was born. Yeah. And so fact, without without all the Nazi, the Nazi around him, this new child has every chance to be yeah. happy and to become a good person. And as they said, Tomas started off being really kind and lovely and good and much more like his mother. But then all this influence and all this stuff went on that made him snap. And the other side of his personality, like that they'd been nurturing, came to light. And he'd probably if be I, on the drugs that they were making as well. If I, if I have to be honest, I think the reason why he snapped is because the... Mm, the new child was put into uh, Dolores' womb. And uh, the fear of being substituted, the fear of being forgotten, the, the fear of being thrown away like yesterday garbage because yeah. that was, could have happened made him snap. Not just because uh, Hitler's personality raised inside yeah. him. and it, I think it was more because of what they were doing than not because of who his yes. father was. I definitely think so, because they say that his personality changed three months ago, which is when Dolores was pregnant. And I think, yeah, that fear that you've been raised to be someone special and then you can just be replaced. It, it can, yeah. And he didn't want to not be special. He, he wanted to have meaning, which is what caused him to, like, snap. So we go back to the Vatican and our boys are being thanked like heroes for their wonderful job for helping clear out some of the evil that has been in the Vatican and being told that like, after all you've seen, like you could like lose faith. And they're like, no, we're not going to lose faith. We have a job to do. And he and the, the person they're talking to, I can't remember what his name is now, but he's, um, Bishop Saul. That's it. But he's all like, what I would love for you guys is you guys are going to be the light, the light that shines through the church, the light that gives faith, like just a really positive, strong influence for people to look up to and follow. 
and then it all ends beautifully with it turns out Roberto is the one that's cooking all these lovely dinner and he's a great dinner and he wants to make sure that Joseph is well fed because he's, you know, looking a bit poorly and he's like, oh, if you don't eat well and be like, you know, healthy, you're not going to be healthy for your brother and Ryota's not going to be happy if you're not looking after your health. And then we see a last shot of Roberto, not Roberto, a last shot of Ryota looking at a bookmark in his book. It was so beautiful and it was such a great end for this arc of narration. Mm. I mean, I wasn't expecting it to go full Nazis and actually have Hitler there. But the fact that it's it's based on truth. I expected the whole Nazi craziness, but not Hitler's body. I really believe the, that the most holy thing that I broke with them was the real Longino spur. Yeah, I am naive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that they found one of the most power, powerful relic in the whole Christianity history, but I really didn't see them bringing Hitler's that body with them. So yeah, 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 it was it was quite the twist. And also after all of that, nothing supernatural. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It was all conspiracies and abuse and insanity and mental health and drugs and like corruption but actually there was no actual supernatural evil they did fight evil and they did fight the devil but they showed that evil and the devil is a man-made thing and they're fighting for like the evil that lives within people and how they abuse it and i was like oh yes no that was very cool that was that was clever and very cool indeed and I really loved it. I'm a little bit sad because we won't see Mario no. again. I'm a little bit sad now. But at <laughs> least, you know, he lived and he wasn't secretly like, you know, the child of Satan or anything. Because for a while you start thinking when they say the minute like, you know, there's another child out there. I'm like, it's going to turn out to be Mario. It's going to turn out. To be... He is too beautiful. He is too important. But you can see why Thomas targeted Mario because he was beautiful and perfect and loved. And that's why he was scapegoating him. But no, anything else to add, Miss Guy? No, not for today. Oh, well, so for today, I say thank you for everyone that's listened. Obviously, if you like Yowie, check out my full Yowie podcast. You can find me on Twitter as Let Zoe Spoil You and my art Twitter, which is Zoe underscore Let. There I've got anime podcast, reviewing various animes, our Beneath Your Skin horror podcast. Just come and chat. It'll be lovely to hear from people. But for now, bye bye. Miss Gaia? Thank you for listening, people, and see you next time. Bye-bye.